following interview was conducted with Diane F. Blackwell, their assistant dean of students for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 15, 2009, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good morning, Diane. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll get started. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents in the early years. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, um, June 7th, 1948. And I would consider myself a city girl. I, I had a very loving family. Education was very important. Um, from as early and as far back as I can remember. My mother was very educated. Um, she had both a, a bachelor's in music and a master's in music, uh, music education. And um, so that was certainly not only her talent, but her skills and just her gift. Um, my father um, was a university graduate as well and um, he served and worked in in the government um, in the social security division but I would even pride myself that my uh, on my paternal grandmother was a college graduate in about 1919 I believe uh, from at that point it was maybe it was a two-year college I'm not sure but she was a teacher. And then my maternal grandfather was a college graduate uh, from a small private um, campus in Missouri, and he was a minister. So education on both sides was planted in, in our family. And um, so growing up, I... What was grade school? Did you have any siblings, any brothers? Sisters? I do. I have a brother, five years older than, than myself, and um, he, he, I think, got the music talent. I, I enjoy music, but I didn't have the music talent the way he did. But um, certainly grandparents were very important in my life, and they supported and encouraged and rewarded and reinforced the importance of success and accomplishment and achievement in education and so I was given a very loving um, childhood and growing up school I loved school I played school before I went to school and then after school I would come home and teach school to my dolls <coughs> excuse me and um, at school I would try to be teacher to some of my friends these are some of the stories my mother would um, you know, share later that I love being in charge, and um, I I just always loved loved school, and I knew it also at an early age I was going to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher. I admired and watched and could see my mother's work as a teacher. So I just thought that's what I'm going to be when I grow what up. What was high school like? Um, high Any school. That you were oh, in? I was always. I, anything sounded, you know, uh, intriguing to me to join, be involved. And, um, yes, in the high school yearbook, you know, under the picture where you would list your activities, I did. I had a thick, um, you know, little narrative there of what I liked to do, what I was involved in, from singing in the choir or being part of what at that point was pep squad and French club and student council and I I loved it all um, my mother never had to encourage me it was maybe you need to restrain but it didn't impact um, my academic performance at all um, so I liked friends I liked being involved and just on the go that was that was just you know my I would say my drill or my pattern was being active and, and involved. Um, probably one, one of the highlights in my high school life was um, uh, my appointment selection to be a foreign exchange student after my junior year in high school. Um, I had early identified that when I got old enough, I was going to be a foreign exchange student because I had met that diverse group of students when they had come to my high school 
even during the time my brother was in high school, and I thought, oh, how wonderful to, to meet someone from another country. Then I learned, oh, you could go to another country and live there. And so I did. I applied, and I could not wait until that junior year when it was, you know, that was the restricted time to apply. And I went through all the application and months and months of preparation, and sure enough, I made the semifinalist list and then the finalist list and then I awaited word of where am I going to go and I did sign up and say I was willing to take any assignment um, and you know one has grandiose thoughts that since I had had three years of French oh I could probably I can see myself in France and that was not the case um, I was chosen and selected to go to Turkey Oops. And this was in the summer of 1965. And I did have a little pause that, oh, I won't be able to use any of my French, but I also don't know any Turkish. And, but it wasn't a matter of, oh, I don't think now I wanna go. It was just, hmm, this, this will be intriguing. So you, you check out the books from the library um, at that time to find out, so what am I gonna see and learn and do? But then the information starts flowing, and it was just going to be sort of a magical, intriguing journey. And so I went to Turkey for the summer after my junior year and lived with two different families and had a great time. Loved it. Was it. Just, it was just for the summer, not for the school year? Correct. Okay. It was the summer program. Okay. Um, and, I mean, I lived in a small village on the Bosporus, um, and... It was Sea of Marmara, and I learned a lot about geography. I learned a lot about myself and being self-reliant. Um, it was its own education. And um, so anyway, that, that probably triggered my love for travel um, for that stint and has carried on into my entire life where I'm up for any kind of travel. Um, but I came back. I grew up a lot. I matured after that experience, and um, but I've never forgotten um, just the opportunities that were afforded to me. And so from there, uh, great senior year in high school, and uh, then I pursued where am I going to go to college? And my parents were divorced, so I was raised by my mother. She raised my brother and myself, and. I, I really did feel great uh, connection and responsibility to be fair in the family and not venture too far away. Uh, and I sort of limited maybe my, uh, quote, the uh, dream, dream campus to what was more realistic for my family. And that was staying closer to home. And um, I didn't follow in my brother's footsteps. That was sort of where I would say, typical of me, I wanted to be independent and I don't always go, um, I go the beat of a different drummer to some uh, topics. And so um, my mother's college and my brother's and had been in my family was a small private liberal arts school in Missouri. And when I expressed that I didn't think that was for me, I went to the small private liberal arts school in Kansas. And, and it turned out to be great. It was wonderful. It was small. It was smaller than my high school. But that, in fact, was, um, it, it made it a great environment. It was a small town since I had been in a city. And I cultivated and made such great friends, friends for was life. Was co-ed or? Oh, yes, okay. very, very much co-ed. Uh, Methodist Affiliated School, Baker University, okay. very old. And um, I joined a sorority. Um, I, I had studied I, what was available there, great teacher education. So I knew I was going to be majoring in elementary ed. And um, the history of the the Methodist Church in connection to that uh, campus was extremely strong and being a Methodist myself and having a grandfather who was a Methodist minister that certainly had its influence so went there graduated from there in 1970 and um, but in college 
just a lot of what I will call very uh, good, wholesome, um, grounded activities and um, good role models, excellent role models on the university front. Uh, I had a part-time job, which was really just to give me a little spending money. I worked in the um, dean of st- the dean of women's office, not dean of students, but the dean of women's office, and she happened to also be the uh, panhellenic advisor. And um, you know, but she she served. I did that for two years, and so a young woman. Um, who also then taught in the classroom, taught sociology classes. and uh, But it was great to have that connection with yeah, a faculty, administrator, um, that carryover. So she probably had a strong influence on me um, just from, you know, her our dialogues and Being t- interaction. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then, but the other role models were the advisors, the volunteers who came to my sorority chapter, um, and alumni, um, men and women, were to just sort of paint the picture of what was available after you graduate from college and what there is waiting for you that it w- can continue, and there is that lifelong association. Um, I, I found that to be very welcoming, very inspiring. And, and I also found it to be fulfilling. Um, and that's, that carried over, that yeah. I, I really I took up those invitations right. and opportunities after I graduated. But um, certainly I met my um, future husband in this setting. And at the school? At, at, in college, absolutely. Okay. And so we dated for two years, and then he had graduated, but we then married after I graduated. From college, and uh, so we we shared similar backgrounds by being on that campus and knowing a lot of people, um, and we still have very close connections. That has been, um, um, you know, that there is great value in that that you can all grow up together and good times, sad times, and challenging times. We've uh, we can reflect on that heritage. Then what came next afterwards? So what did you did you after um, you graduated? After gr- graduating, um, I landed uh, that preparation that you get in college. My degree, I went straight into the uh, was hired in a very large um, public school system outside of Kansas City on the Kansas side, and I was um, I taught fifth grade. I was a classroom teacher, and um, it was challenging. Um, I think back and oh my my my, um, you know, they must have had great faith in hiring this 22 year old because in my first year of teaching I had 31 youngsters, and um, you know you do it all. Well, it wasn't quite like living and growing up in college where you have a few classes and then you can go back and forth. This was, it it was a stretch to think you get up early in the morning and you don't get home till late and then you do this at least five days a week so the real world was very um, much of an adjustment you know what's going to happen you're told but then when it hits it is like this is big time this is real life and this is for real uh, this is for real um, I thought my first paycheck was that I I mean I just felt like oh I am so honored and you know aren't I valuable which on today's standards was pittance, but um, it was a wonderful, I had a wonderful career. I had, again, outstanding role models, uh, thank goodness, uh, my fellow teachers and colleagues that, I mean, they assisted me. Here's, we worked as a team, um, and that that set a tone how important it is to share, and ask questions, and I am one. How, 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 you know, what? And they were very, very helpful. So um, it went well, and um, I, I worked in several different school districts, but I, in total, um, taught in the elementary level for 18 years. I, I taught 16 years of fifth grade and two years of fourth grade. 
and in the first few years I earned my master's in uh, elementary education and that was certainly a way to advance um, but to use those experiences directly from the classroom for the practical uh, higher ed and so I, I did not have that luxury of going to graduate school um, and doing that alone. I was balancing teaching full-time and going to graduate and school. Married, right? And being married. Right. Correct. And um, so that's, that's just the way it was then. And um, so, we, um, so teaching literally was my bag. Um, very, very rewarding. Very challenging. But I had some premier settings, and I, um, it goes back to sometimes you, you just, I learned a lot too, but I probably developed a great fifth grade sense of humor uh, with those students, and I mean, they, they were just delightful. And to see that light bulb go off uh, Never with, goes away. With, with students and youngsters, um, that's my first love, is working with students. Then what came next? Should we talk about coming to Purdue? Or uh, in between, we've had a few moves. Uh, I had one other career um, through moves with my husband, um, and that was in Ames, Iowa. Um, teaching was not... Um, being a teacher in that school district and just some different roadblocks didn't work out and we we had two children two sons and when we moved to Ames Iowa in 1991 uh, our oldest son was getting ready to enter high school difficult transition our younger son was getting ready to enter fifth grade so I thought it was extremely important that I try to be as available as possible um, for for the family situation and um, I waited a little while a couple years and then I did um, pursue what was available, and that was working for a human service United Way agency <coughs> uh, program that served uh, youth and families of Central Iowa. And I, I got involved through being on a volunteer committee in the community, and later that unfolded into some other work. So I became the director of that foundation for that, uh, not just program, but for that um, youth services corporation. And I did that for almost seven years. And um, then, you know, felt that my time had been well spent and um, I needed to sort of take a break. So when we came to Purdue in 2001, um, it, again, fresh start, but I had been out of teaching by then for 10 years. And I thought I best assess and do some soul searching of what might be available. And it took a few years um, for me to more or less be pointed or see the stars get aligned. Um, I had been working as a volunteer all these years with students and with my sorority. Um, and and I, I um, am serving my national headquarters as a volunteer officer and being involved in leadership programs um, all along the way. So I wasn't out of touch and sure enough here at Purdue I became um, involved with the Panhellenic Association as a regional person um, and that, that opened doors. I was able to make connections and sure enough, in uh, the summer of 2004, I made an application to apply for the um, Student Activities and Organizations Department of the Office of the Dean of Students. And they were looking for applicants and candidates who had worked with students, leadership, all the above, in education, masters, um, and I applied. And um, I did get to go through an interview, and things did not quite line up for what they were looking for, what, where I could best utilize all my years' experience. But what it did was open up the conversation later that there was, there was a need to have someone help in the fraternity and sorority life, um, particularly with the sororities. And 
just jump fast forward when that was dangled before me I just jumped at it and said this is the dream job and um, I, I was able to jump right in um, didn't miss a beat and what were some of the things that you were involved in? I'm thinking of the researchers might want to know some of the Okay, things researchers. Well, first of all, on this campus with um, the history of the sorority, the needs, why, why or what is the purpose of um, Greek organizations, Greek letter organizations, sororities and fraternities. And if we look back in history, even at Purdue, we know that women had a special need particularly in 1915, for social connections, women that they could share similar, um, you know, interests in the sorority. That's one of the beginning principles of similar backgrounds, your interests, uh, that friendship connection. It's huge, and it can build from there. And so then as more and more women join, it's like, well, this, the system grows and more groups are added both on the sorority and the fraternity side which was going fairly strong so in 1915 first sorority was organized Kappa Alpha Theta here at Purdue and then through the years more groups have come and my, uh, my chapter Alpha Chi Omega was um, colonized in 1918 here at Purdue but we have many old old chapters uh, that have been in continuous business since you know that time which speaks to heritage um, longevity strength and purpose um, the values um, are still I would say right in line that striving and helping to promote education um, we believe in academic achievement uh, offering leadership opportunities, um, teaching responsibility, because in most cases, those sororities, the women themselves govern one another. And um, skills that are outside of the classroom that can only enhance. And social etiquette, yes, that was one of those ideals. But, I mean, there were many, many programs, finances, um, just you know, trying to build upon what what could develop women, and uh, to being thinkers, valuable leaders, and and um, you know, and also lifelong involvement. Were you involved in all the fraternities that were primarily with the sororities? Um, the first four years in my position as assistant dean of students, I worked solely with the sororities on this campus mm -hmm. as the panelonic advisor. In this past year, um, we there's been a, a new approach that there needed to be more back and forth, fluid flow, so that I've been heavily involved in the fraternities and meeting with the gentlemen and working with them. But those two groups together, the sororities and the fraternities, that a lot of that be consolidated into similar programs. So you're with one, and then you're sort of with the other, but then you're really with them sure. together. But my focus was primarily on the sororities and um, taking a look at how their programs could improve, offering um, uh, um, two particular programs and then, um, that started. The first one was in 2005, and that was one we named Own Your Future, A Woman's Guide to Success, and it was geared to the juniors and senior members of the sororities to have them hear and be advised from expert, quote, expert um, uh, speaker, and Susan Butler was our first speaker. She was a member, or is a member, was in a sorority when she was here on campus, and so she felt she could also speak to what her ex her sorority experience had done for her as a guide and how that fit in with the other goals and objectives in her life. So Susan Butler, the next year um, we had um, Becky Skillman, um, and then we also had, um, this is, 
another, another sure. uh, former uh, Indiana Secretary of State, uh, Sue Ann Gilroy, came up with it. Um, but leaders, um, prominent they women. A lot oh, just to listen to, they've had all bumpy roads along the way, and yet we, we may not know or hear that or think that. So they can, it's called tell your story and what is the guide. But much of it was you've got your education and, and continue to learn um, and try different things and reach out. But some very good, helpful hints um, in a great approach. And Dr. Cordova also had, was a part of that program. Um, so we, I think we really tried to target for the women. Um, there are role models out there, and that was sort of their bottom line too. Find a mentor. I'll, I'll find yeah, more than one. Like you've been involved in the mentoring. It's yes. very encouraging that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mentoring is huge. And um, because it, it is going to maybe make it easier for you, and then, then you can pass that baton on to someone else. Yeah. So the other part of sorority life, um, I feel that needed a lot more attention or to be revised, refined, was um, the, the recruitment process and bringing about a little better community relations between the sororities. Not that it was all bad, there's co healthy competition, but that there needed to be perhaps greater trust among those groups. They share more in common than they do differences sure, sure. and to build that. And by bringing in um, the presidents of those chapters and having them get better appointed, they become friends, it trickles on down, and that Panhellenic is there uh, to promote service, to promote um, harmony, if nothing else, and why we need to do this. So recruitment was very important that we not get so caught up into activities, but more of what is the message? Why join a sorority? And there's always work to be done on that front. Sure, sure. There truly is. But um, recruitment and helping young women grow and develop, um, the sorority can have a main, be a major stakeholder in that process. Right. And they do a lot of special things, and like the for Easter and, and, and a lot of things in the community. That, so I, it, with it, it follows along with engagement. Yes. Which is very, you know, yes. has grown a lot over since Dr. Chester came. Yes. Philanthropy. Right. Uh, the, the projects, hands-on service, um, I, and rather than it just being the sororities you also, and fraternities you look at, well, there are other resources here on campus as well. Um, and so the Women's Resource Office what became a huge friend uh, and partner in what the sororities were able to accomplish, I would say to become elevated as to issues that we need to be addressing that are not addressed in the classroom per se, women's issues, um, domestic violence, um, women's health issues, and the, the ills of society that we see every day pan out. And so there were many programs in the past three years that have been developed, and I think that partnership of the WRO and Panhellenic has been extremely strong and um, and mentoring again uh, comes out of that. We we all need to work together, and um, it, it's been a great journey. Right. And, and of course, as you know, the archives and special collections we have women's uh, archives now, which is just beginning to grow. That that's another area that they can also be using too. They Absolutely, the, the mm -hmm. contributions of many of our poor, you know people that were here a long time ago. So right, what their contribution. To the exactly. There's another program that I was fortunate enough to be a liaison and involved in that was connected with the soror a sorority, but benefited the greater community, and that was um, an endowment that had been gifted by Delta Gamma Sorority, called the Delta Gamma Lectureship in Values and Ethics. It's a long title but um, established and here at Purdue, we had our first Delta Gamma lecture or lectureship program in April of 2005. 
and this that was a thrill. Um, Panhellenic was heavily involved in that with Delta Gamma, and um, Robin Roberts from ABC Good Morning America was our first speaker. And you know, just the program and the idea of take a look and listen to the story of this woman and. I mean, this was a new program on this campus, and to um, take part and help develop that and work with the, the leadership and the membership of that chapter, I was their I was their advisor for this. So I've had uh, great rewards in seeing that evolve, and then the next year we were we became a partner with the libraries when Amy Tan. Um, came to campus and what a gift to libraries for that but um, I mean a role model oh my goodness um, her story and then um, we had uh, for the third year we had Joan Brock who was the author of more beyond uh, just a minute um, beyond the eyes of what you see I'm not getting that title right more than the eyes can see excuse me and she is a blind woman. And her message about uh, the values and her steps, um, the whole essence of a lectureship in values and ethics ha has been you know, delivered from each of those speakers in different ways. But it all spoke to what you, the, you know, the beauty within, the beauty on the outside and, and the world around and decisions that you make. Um, Steve Ford was the speaker um, for the uh, latest uh, lectureship this past December. And um, I mean, he certainly brought a strong message because of his father, President Gerald Ford. So I, I, I feel that, that that was an added bonus to being um, panel link advisor to work and be the messenger in the office of the Dean of Students for, for that particular program. And it's going to go on because it is an endowment. And um, has it, has this, but the series had not been started until you started it. Been uh, doing the, it. Uh, the, the series with the program did not start until I was here. Okay. And um, the, endow the, en the, en the endowment was only completed in the spring of 2002. And then there was sort of a, uh, a rest time. And when um, the Office of the Dean of Students hired me, um, I was asked if I would be willing to take that project on as, you know, representing. Um, and I, I absolutely was thrilled. So we took it from, you know, just that beginning, okay, what's, you know, who would we want? And suggestions, but it involves, you know, that's that's a team effort. It's not one person, a, a lot of team players, but I think everyone was satisfied and, um, and anticipate and looks forward to the next. And um, getting it, um, you know, on the road, it is only going to get stronger and stronger. And that's key. Mm -hmm. That's very mm -hmm. good. Right. Um, let's talk about your hobbies and special interests. Do you have any that you'd like to share with us? hobbies. I like to go to movies. Um, I love to travel. Travel is, um, I, I just find it exhilarating to visit and explore uh, new destinations. Um, I like mountains and I also like oceans and usually you have to go opposite places for that. But I, I will travel almost anywhere and I haven't been everywhere but um, this summer, I'm going to Turkey, returning to Turkey and taking my husband so that he can learn what I experienced decades and decades ago Super. and uh, see that firsthand. So um, I like sports um, as a, you know, a, a fan and also as not as a participant, but certainly as an observer. I That's like right. <laughs> I, I like sports yeah. too. Now I know. Do you have a, a Purdue tradition that you like to share with us? That comes well, to mind. Oh well, I you can have more than one. I have probably. I don't know if it's tradition, but I have a lot of black and gold in my closet, a lot. And um, I, I've been <laughs> coined by some of the panel link women. It's like 
do you just wear, you must just wear black and gold. You have nothing else, and it's like, no, 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 no. I do have more than that. But then I look down, it's like, okay, when I see that out shopping, it's like, oh, that would be good for Purdue. And so I have acquired a great deal. <laughs> I love it. Um, every uh, home football game, the flag goes out early, early in the morning on the front porch. Um, love that flag. Uh, love to see you it. take that with you. Oh yes, um, and it will it will always be waving when Purdue plays. So that's a tradition, and um, oh, I find probably the tradition that I love and find very empowering is um, our commencement here at Purdue. Spectacular. Um, I I don't obviously have children going through commencement, but. I find that I need Kleenex when I go to a commencement and I see those graduates make the procession. It gives me chills right now. Um, Bless their hearts. I just, you know, I love that. Um, I love the music, um, the fight song. Uh, Those are the kind of traditions that, you know, they just leave an imprint on your mind. And and when, after we leave, when when you do see the engineering fountain and the bell tower, I, I hear the bells. Uh, I think I'll always know that sound. Right. Let's talk about uh, family. You know, two, two sons. Two sons. Okay. Yes. Our older son was born in 1977, and um, he currently lives in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, he received a bachelor's degree from Iowa State and a master's degree from um, the University of Kansas. And uh, he is married, um, and there is a seven-year-old child um, in the family uh, that my son has learned to love very much. And um, Brett works at uh, the University of Kansas Endowment uh, Association at the KU Med Center in Kansas City. So he is a fundraiser for the Department of Neurology. And um, that's, uh, we don't get to see him very often, but I look forward to that. Our younger son was born in September of 1980, and he graduated from Iowa State in the uh, December of 2003. And he graduated with a degree in um, turf grass management. And turf grass management, more specifically, baseball turf. He's a horticulture degree, but he specialized in that kind of grass. So he is going to be one that will always be associated probably with professional baseball fields. He loves it, adores it. We don't know where that really came from, but that is his line of work. He's single now, lives in San Antonio, and um, he's just, um, he is a delight. So no daughters, and I guess that also is why I was able to have a lot of fun with the Panhellenic uh, area. It gave me a chance to be with the young women. <laughs> How about the next stage? And then an outstanding, got an outstanding After, when I leave Purdue, um, I, I hope to keep in touch and keep in contact with a lot of the great people that have made this a wonderful experience. Um, Time has gone quickly, um, but I take pride knowing that I I was in every single sorority house. I knew every house director. I ate many a meal in a lot of those houses as, you know, just an invited guest. Um, And that, you know, what I learned and what hopefully I added, um, you know, will will continue and, and, uh, you know, I will always be available if, if, if someone wants to call or keep in touch, you know, I can reflect on that. Um, I am involved as a volunteer with my own sorority headquarters. I serve on the National Council as the National Vice President and was elected last summer. That term will um, end in 2010, and um, at that time, I will, I will feel like I will have completed good service as a volunteer traveling the country, visiting different campuses, and asking, you know, what the, the questions 
having those conversations, um, both with their professional staff on that campus and with the sorority women and officers as to how is the experience, how could it improve? And I think that's the question that I will, I've learned so well over the years, I will always keep asking. What do you like best about it? How could it be improved if you could go out and change it? And um, so when I moved to Kansas City, um, volunteering, I, I love being a volunteer um, in organizations. Um, I also serve as a member of my alumni association at Baker University. So I'm going to be a very, very close to my alma mater and be able to return to campus. Um, I go there now a couple of times a year, but I will be much closer and can renew those relationships and take part in those activities that distance did not offer uh, prior to that. Um, my father lives in Kansas City. Um, he's 90 years old. I want to say that he is going to be a top priority of mine in moving back. I want to spend quality time with him while I can and make that time count after not having a lot of time with him. Um, I, I just, I, I want to keep my options open and um, explore the city. I think there is always um, opportunity to learn and maybe not think, oh, well, someday, but make it that day. That's right. Okay. How about, a, do you have an outstanding event that you that comes to mind? That it happened here at Purdue? It does any place. It doesn't have to be at Purdue. Mm -hmm. An event. Is there something special, maybe? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, because it's probably so uh, immediate, I, this, this weekend and um, for several years, beginning way back in 2001, I have represented the uh, fraternity sorority world by going to Washington, D.C. in April um, once a year for a weekend or weekday called Visits on the Hill with congressmen and senators and being the representative from my national organization to help lobby for the Collegiate Housing Infrastructure Act. And there usually are 400 volunteers that this is organized and orchestrated to the nth degree about teens that go in and make these calls. And that's, that's a very, um, golly, I mean, it, it, it's empowering. It also is exciting to be there on the Hill, going into those offices where you have been scheduled with your appointment and to present your case in 20 minutes and out you go and on to other things and then to interact just in that political arena in in this you know small way you hope that um, that kind of either excitement or that investment sometime will pay off but that's that's the event in the for the sorority connection and volunteer and now I'm taking it as I've been a professional on a very large campus as well as a volunteer, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. You're going right. Any closing comments that you might share as you look back or looking ahead or both? Being a woman today, I'm, and either who I am or where I uh, am at this point, I don't think I ever would have predicted when I was in college or even when I was first teaching in the classroom that I would be um, recording a part of my history with Purdue University. Um, I'm very grateful. I'm very humble. Um, Purdue has brought out um, either urges, desires. Uh, it has stimulated me to think creatively uh, and to work with, literally, the best. Uh, the Purdue, Purdue name gets people through the door. And, and so once that door is open, um, then if you're ready and you've done the preparation and the planning, you can, you can move a lot of agendas. And I'm just very grateful that I had that door to really open 
And I, not that I've gotten every initiative through, but that it gave me the confidence uh, to be able to say, and why not? Um, so I, I'm very, I will always be very, very proud that uh, I served in, you know, the, the role I served, and um, I'll always be a loyal boiler maker. Go Boilers. Right. Go Boilers. Right. That's Thank right. You. Thank you very much.